The blood pressure cuff is this entire component right here. This is the Svig mominometer. This is the bulb that allows us to inflate the bladder. Where these two hoses connect, there's a bladder housed inside, and this is what wraps around the arm. A couple things that you need to be familiar with. The index line is found on the far edge of the blood pressure cuff. Now the index line needs to fall between the minimum and the maximum range in order for this cuff to work correctly. As you can see, if you fall outside of the minimum, you must select a smaller cuff. If you fall outside of the maximum, you must select a larger cuff. Sizing of the appropriate blood pressure cuff is essential to getting an accurate readout. I've zoomed in so we can take a closer look at the Svig manometer, and on closer inspection you'll notice that the hash marks are in increments of two, which means when you're recording your manual blood pressures, whether that be a palpated or an auscultated blood pressure, it is important that you don't document odd numbers because technically you can't get an odd number on a manual blood pressure cuff. Automatic blood pressure cuffs, however, do have the ability to give you odd number readouts. Typically, a normal blood pressure is considered to be 120 systolic to 80 diastolic. In your lecture component of the class, you should have talked about what a systolic pressure is and what a diastolic pressure is, but basically a systolic pressure is a pressure that is exerted on the walls of the arteries during systole, or the heart's contraction phase. During diastole, or the heart's relaxing phase, the pressure that is constantly pushing on the sides of the artery is known as the diastolic pressure. It's important to understand the relationship between both the systolic and the diastolic pressure. Zooming in on the inflation bulb, we see that there is a dial at the top. The proper way to hold this bulb is in your hand with your thumb and your forefinger in between the dial. So your thumb and your forefinger should have full control of this dial. Turn it all the way to the right to inflate. Turn it all the way to the left to fully deflate. When you are obtaining a blood pressure, it's important that you learn how to control the release of air through this valve. When you are releasing the air while you are taking a blood pressure, it's important that it comes out in a very slow, controlled manner, which means that your thumb and your forefinger must only move the dial a small amount. So when you're applying a blood pressure cuff to a patient's arm, it's important that you use the artery mark. In this case, since we're applying this on the upper arm, we will line this up with the brachial artery, which is just medial to the bicep. And then we can wrap the rest of the cuff around the patient's arm. Sometimes you might have to move the dial in order to see it better, but this is a proper location of the blood pressure cuff. It's hard to see the elbow on this mannequin, but the crease of the elbow is about right here. So we've got about an inch above that crease or the antecubital space so that we can fit our stethoscope there when we take an auscultated pressure and it just allows for better coverage of that artery by the bladder. All right, so I have my dial in a location where we can easily see what I'm about to describe to you. I would like you guys to start practicing by rapidly inflating the cuff under up to 160 millimeters of mercury and then drop it at the following rate. So we should be seeing the needle fall at a rate of about two hash marks a second. So one one thousand, that's about the rate we want right there. This is how you should be taking your blood pressures. We'll talk about how to actually obtain one in a moment, but it's important to realize the rate that you let the needle fall is a direct reflection of how accurate your blood pressure will be. For instance, I will let out the rest of the cuff by rapidly opening up the valve now, which is common to do after you obtain a blood pressure and have the final readout. So I'll retighten the valve here and I'll increase the pressure. What happens if you rapidly dump the air out of the bladder like so is you tend to skip large portions of the blood pressure and you end up with glaring inaccuracies in your vital signs, which is something we want to avoid at all times. So again, when you inflate the cuff, and 160 is just an arbitrary number, 
depending on your patient population, you will modify that. This is the rate we should be falling the needle at. So it's important to accurately obtain and document your vital signs. So let's demonstrate what a palpated blood pressure would look like. We've got our cuff appropriately placed on the arm, the dial in a location where we can see it, and I've got the radial artery palpated. I will rapidly inflate the cuff until I do not feel a radial pulse anymore. Once I feel the radial pulse diminish and disappear entirely, I will go an additional 30 points on the dial above when I felt it disappear, and then I will slowly drop the needle. There we go. About two hash marks a second. And I feel the pulse return at 118. Do not press very hard on the radial artery. The blood pressure cuff is constricting arterial blood flow distal to this cuff. Meaning that when we deflate the cuff and allow some of that arterial blood flow to come by the cuff again, and we can palpate it at the radial site, this will not be very strong. So it's important that you don't press harder than you have to. So while you're inflating it, pay attention to how much pressure you're applying. Ease off to the point where you can just barely feel the pulse, but it's clear enough, and then let the needle drop. As you deflate, make sure that you are looking at the dial the entire time. Don't get distracted and look at other things. Don't look at the pulse site. This is what you're looking at the entire time. The moment you feel the pulse return, document the number that the needle was at. Do not use the needle bouncing as a reliable test for a patient's blood pressure. That is inaccurate. So let's talk about the stethoscope now. These are the earpieces. You always want to make sure you have these covers on. And you also want these to face forward slightly when you put them in your ears. So if I were to put these in my ears, I would face the angle away from my ears as I'm putting them on. So I put them on like this. You want to make sure this tubing is intact, that there are no rips or tears, because that will alter the sound and greatly diminish it. This is the bell and the diaphragm of the stethoscope, collectively known as the head of the stethoscope. Primarily, we are concerned with the use of the diaphragm, which is basically a plastic membrane stretched over a metal drum-like material to amplify the sound. So you always want to make sure you inspect this if there's cracks or tears or if there's separations here it'll become ineffective and you won't be able to hear anything or it'll be drastically reduced. Now, there is a swiveling motion to a lot of these models of stethoscopes. It's important that you put the earpieces in your ears and actually listen to make sure that, okay, I've got the right side activated because by flipping it 180 degrees, all of a sudden, this side of the stethoscope is activated. So this is the bell. This is the diaphragm. All right, so let's demonstrate an auscultated blood pressure. For this one, we're going to use our stethoscope, have the diaphragm firmly over the brachial artery in the antecubital space, pressing down. The surface of the diaphragm should be evenly sealed to the skin, and then press down a little bit to ensure an adequate seal. When you inflate the cuff, we will inflate past where we felt the palpated pulse disappear. Again, we're going 30 points past that, so I'm at 180 now, and I'm letting this out at a rate of two hash marks a second. Now I'm listening for the first sounds. The first sounds will be faint. Those are your systolic pressures. As soon as you hear those first sounds, make a mental note of them, and then we're listening for the sounds to disappear. They will gradually diminish and then all of a sudden drop off entirely. So I heard my first sound here at 118. So that's the systolic pressure. Now I'm continuing to hear them throughout this process 
until they get weaker and weaker, and there they go. They just dropped off completely at 76. And now I can let out the rest of the pressure in the cuff, and I've got my blood pressure auscultated at 118 over 76. Looking at the study guide here for blood pressure, pay attention to how the palpated blood pressure is documented. So we got 114. We documented that over P. That lets everybody know this is a palpated pressure. Okay, so they got 114 systolic over P. Palpated pressures only yield the systolic blood pressure. Okay, and we'll document that appropriately. 114 over P. For your auscultated, you get both the systolic and the diastolic. And a good way to remember which one goes on top, which one goes on bottom, when you're first learning, just remember, we live in San Diego, S, D, all right? Systolic, diastolic. So the auscultated blood pressure should be within 10 millimeters of mercury of the palpated pressure. All right, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know, and we'll see you on the next one.